bonsoir and welcome to our panelists and participants from all over the world. My name is Chantal Chetla Komagata. I'm the coordinator for Universal Peace Federation in Europe, and it's a pleasure to greet you to this webinar. First, let's deal with some technical details. We have translation into Russian and French. You can choose your language by clicking on the globe at the bottom of your screen. The chat icon is for remarks and information, and the bios of the panelists will be available there too. For questions, please use the Q&A icon. Some of them will be answered by our staff or other viewers, and a few will be dealt with by the panelists during our Q&A session. We will be looking at the power of humanitarian initiatives in overcoming division. And this is particularly about the 241 kilometer long and four kilometer wide DMZ on the Korean Peninsula. We will examine how humanitarian initiatives that transcend partisanship can contribute to peace by overcoming division and differences. You will hear about best practices and about the consequences of sanctions imposed by the UN or of the lockdown due to the pandemic. Panelists will offer recommendations towards building mutual trust between North and South Korea and ways to envision a peaceful future for all. What has motivated UPF to have over 100 discussions on the Korean Peninsula since last November? The UPF founders were both born in what is today North Korea and shared the destinies of millions of refugees who fled the North during the Korean War. And only after 40 years, they were able to make their historical visit to Pyongyang. It was in 1991, so just 30 years ago. There they met with then President Kim Il-sung. Sun Myung Moon spoke clearly of his stand against communism. And that meeting in 91 resulted in many fruitful initiatives that can be considered as humanitarian because they aim at achieving a community of solidarity and mutual prosperity. As the founders have been repeating it, to bring reconciliation, you need to gain the trust of the other party and go beyond your self-interest. We will hear from some people who have been living for the sake of others with the vision of overcoming enmity by bringing reconciliation. They have all had to go through trust building measures that are at the heart of humanitarian initiatives. We will first see a short video filmed by the Swiss television in 2017 of the humanitarian activities done by the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, which is based in Pyongyang. So let's see the film. Our country is to 80%. This North Korean member of the staff says that the country is 80% mountainous and that in the past people deforested indiscriminately. That was during the Great Famine in the 90s. The population still suffers from the consequences of erosion today. And people are shown how to stabilize and reforest the slopes and which plants grow best on the hillside. And Mr. Fizzler is showing the wide variety of trees and plants that are best matched together and that bring forth valuable crops. He mentions that the people learn quickly. And uh, he's really showing the diversity uh, of, the, of the plants that come from different places. He also says that once something functions well, then other people come and they copy from each other. So even after six decades of planned economy, the farmers still seem to have an entrepreneurial spirit. The planned economy demands that they give away everything they plant, but what grows there in the hills 
they are allowed to use themselves for trade or market, although officially there's no market at all. And in the villages, hygiene is a big problem. Many children die of diarrhea because of it. There's no running water. So the agency also helped there. Thanks to the solar panel, over 4,000 people receive fresh and pure water that is pumped from 3.5 kilometers away to the different houses that we can see in the back. So it's with the same motivation of contributing to peace on the Korean Peninsula and the world that our co-founder, Mrs. Hak Jahan Moon, is launching numerous projects, among which Think Tank 2022. It's a worldwide group of experts in politics, academics, religion, business, and the media who can contribute with their knowledge and experience to the Korean reunification. I hope you will support this with your competencies. So without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker. He already appears here. It's Mr. Uh, uh, Thomas Fiesler, whom you just saw in the video in his former capacity as the director of cooperation for the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation based in Pyongyang. He was Switzerland's resident representative in the DPRK for four years until he retired end of 2017. He has then accepted assignments for the same agency through 2018 in Bangladesh and 19 in Kabul, Afghanistan. He holds diplomas in civil engineering and construction management. And as an expert on, on North Korea, he's being invited to speak at numerous conferences and had to record his speech beforehand. So he won't be pre present in person, unfortunately. Let's... Good Please. afternoon, everybody. Um, I have had the honor or the privilege to live and work for four years in North Korea between 2013 and 2017. And I'm going to talk today uh, about the humanitarian program or to be more precise, um, the expectation for a possible new start after the COVID-19 pandemic. I think this is highly relevant, <clears throat> as everyone knows, as of current, the entire country is in a total lockdown. Nothing is going in or out. So <clears throat> let me say a few things about the persisting humanitarian needs. They are actually worsening. As of 2019, 10 million people in North Korea, which is about 40%, are undernutrition or malnourished. Eventually, all the humanitarian organization left the DPRK early 2020 due to the pandemic situation. International humanitarian aid, which was up to 2019, around 50 million per year, um, reduced to a few million dollars in 2020 and is currently at zero. No UN agency, no INGO, no one is currently in the country. <clears throat> so that means humanitarian monitoring also ceased to exist. The DPRKs or the North Korean lockdown measures are impacting the lives of ordinary people more than any externally imposed sanctions in the past. <clears throat> However, fact is, in rural areas, people live on subs sub subsistence. No or very marginal improvements were visible outside Pyongyang, even pre-COVID-19 times. The existing private market economy, though key to people's survival, has been impacted by draconian measures preventing the spread of COVID-19. People aren't allowed to travel right now. They aren't allowed, even by that time, but even moreover now, they are not able to travel from A to B. 
the daily struggle with their livelihood uh, allows doesn't allow them even to consider their situation. They actually don't know how bad things are. But it needs to be said that people are extremely resi resilient and remain absolutely loyal. No criticism or questions are noticed. So what's the current situation right now? North Korea closed its borders in January 2020. It was the first country in the world to do so to protect itself against the virus. Since then, no imports of humanitarian assistance was possible. Food imports, international staff deployments, physical monitoring access may likely remain curtailed for a prolonged period. Uh, some people estimate, and I would partly share that opinion, I believe before 2023, North Korea will not open its borders. In the event of crisis, it is also assumed that, and it has happened in the past, that China may assist with some cereals uh, by shipments. WFP, which was vital in supporting uh, children under five with additional nutritional support, ceased its operations also in 2020. DPRK or North Korea still insists that they haven't seen any COVID-19 <coughs> cases, though experts suggest <coughs> suggest that this is unlikely. There must be some pockets of corona cases, but uh, I think they were well isolated. There are just a few foreigners from some embassies remaining in the country but they are bound to stay in Pyongyang and they have no ways and means of traveling and look at the situation abroad, outside Pyongyang. As a means to reverse some of the more liberal attitude in the past years, which I experienced in my time, the COVID-19 containment measures such as the rules in economic activities and the travel as well as imports in fishing in border and coastal areas having had a high impact are now no more possible. It is actually such that as a consequence of the self-imposed isolation, uh, along with that currently a kind of ideological re-education is also noticed from the media out of North Korea. They are trying to be able to tell the people highest possible self-reliance and have increased their restrictive measures such as uh, restrictions on private market economy, uh, language even, and so on. So reaching those in most need will have to be negotiated all over again. It was possible to do so up until 2019, but all these ties, all these connections, all these means have ceased to exist. A country like, or let's say, UN organizations should maintain open channels with the respective North Korean missions abroad, should maintain a dialogue and discuss about humanitarian assistance. I think this is very uh, important. <clears throat> Traveling will be most likely impacted by quarantine time, be it in China, be it in North Korea, so all of this will contribute to a very difficult process. 
office infrastructure, logistics, cars, all has been left behind and no one is taking care of it or very marginal of these premises, the compounds, the offices, hardware equipment, IT, internet access, cars, local staff, all of this needs to be built up from scratch again. And that will be a big task, almost bigger than in the 90s. What we will have to keep in mind that uh, uh, no financial ties exist in North Korea, so um, international staff will have to bring in uh, foreign cash, in US dollars, euros, and so on, to start a minimal functioning. Renegotiating the access will be key and gaining information on what is happening in rural areas will be key and will be in the same the biggest challenge. So these are some of the things which we currently consider and which makes any humanitarian uh, intervention in North Korea very, very difficult for the moment. We have nothing much than wait until the border opens and then hopefully the government will allow to bring in some assistance. I think this is very important. The UN agencies could be at the forefront. INGOs should re-establish their uh, offices and NGOs can also find their ways and means to provide support to the people. I think it is essential to keep in mind that all of this is needed in order to build up relations and to work towards a more understanding and better opening uh, for the people in North Korea who otherwise have zero information on what happens outside their borders. So with these few uh, points I'm making today, um, I would like that uh, this is being given a thought and uh, thank you for the opportunity to have uh, a few words given in this conference to the audience. Thank you very much. So thank you, Mr. Fisler. Um, in, in his speech, uh, Mr. Fisler mentioned that North Korean lockdown measures since January 2020 are impacting the lives of ordinary people even more than uh, the externally imposed sanctions in the past. And uh, I must say one example really surprised me. I checked the Red Cross and I read that in February 2020, the uh, Red Cross and Red Crescent, they had obtained an exemption from the UN sanctions to send medical supplies to North Korea in response to a possible outbreak of the coronavirus. And that the North Korean government did not accept these supplies. So it's always the question, you know, is it the fear of, uh, of bringing in uh, COVID by external people or so? We see how it is now in Japan, right? Uh, the care that all the countries are taking for not getting more virus from different uh, kinds in. So let's now turn to Dr. Alain Destex from Belgium. He is a former General Secretary of Médecins Sans Frontières and was a senator from 1995 to 2019. He's a medical doctor. We can see he is now there in the hospital. He took uh, an hour or so off from his work. And he's also a graduate of the Institute of Political Sciences of Paris. So a medical doctor and politician, that's really wonderful and humanitarian person. He was himself one of the physicians for Médecins Sans Frontières for, for 12 years and deputy medical do director of Pasteur Vaccin. He's an author of books as well as numerous articles on humanitarian action and international relations. Dr. Destex, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chantal. Uh, bonjour or bonsoir, uh, everybody. Uh, 
I was asked to speak in English, so I hope it will be okay for the French uh, translator. And uh, I find uh, uh, Thomas Fisler uh, a presentation extremely interesting, but uh, of course we should also uh, acknowledge that this is a pretty dark uh, picture of what's going on in North Korea uh, in general, but also in terms of uh, humanitarian aid. And the, the major point uh, I would like to make uh, during these few minutes of my, my presentation is that humanitarian aid is never deployed in a vacuum. It's almost always deployed and organized and deliver, deliver in a highly uh, political context. And what I notice in my, in my life is that often many organizations, they don't take enough into account this political context. They just think that, oh, there are people suffering. We just need to help them and you don't have to ask yourself any kind of other questions. But in reality, it doesn't work like that. If you want really to help people and to deliver uh, relief or aid to those people, you have to take into account the political context, whether even and certainly if you want to remain totally neutral and impartial and if your objective is just to help people. And uh, initially this conference was not supposed to be uh, only on uh, Korea, so I would like to take two historical examples to illustrate my point, and then I will move to North Korea. Uh, as you know, I was lucky uh, as a member of parliament to go about 15 years ago for uh, eight days in North Korea. And uh, uh, for listening to the presentation of uh, Dr. Fisler, I don't have the impression that it has changed a lot since, uh, since I was there 15 years ago. So the, the first example uh, I would like to, to take is what happened in, the, in Bosnia, in the former uh, Yugoslavia in uh, between 1992 and 1995. Uh, I think you remember the terrible war which took place there during four years. And uh, uh, most probably the name of Srebrenica, Srebrenica in French, uh, rings a bell. So what happened there, it was an enclave with about 40,000 Bosnian people, uh, mainly Muslim, but also a few, uh, a few Christians there. Uh, uh, they were encircled by the Serbian army, which at the time was still the Yugoslavian uh, army. And they were, they were surrounded and they were starving uh, inside uh, the enclave, uh, surrounded by, by the military forces. And uh, different organizations, the Red Cross, Médecins Sans Frontières, World Food Program, uh, we all wanted to help the, the people inside the enclave uh, but the difficulty was to get access and to be free to deliver the goods to these uh, to these people. And the Serbian army, which was uh, su surrounding the enclave, said, "Okay, you can give food and drugs to the starving people in uh, Srebrenica, but because you said you are impartial and neutral." you have to deliver us the same quantity of food and drugs. So you see here the, the dilemma. In order to have access to the real victims, to those starving, you had to pay a political price. And the political price was to give the same quantity of food and drugs and other relief to the Serbian population around, which was, who was not starving, who had no humanitarian needs. And you had to give that to the Serbian government without any guarantee either that this will go to, to civilian people. We had absolutely no guarantee 
that this would not be given to the Serbian army or to the militia, the same people who were surrounding the, the enclave. And uh, most organizations accepted the, the deal, but what I, will, I want to underline, underline here is the, the difficulty of this political uh, situation, because the only way to get access to the victims and to deliver food and drugs was to accept this kind of unfair, unfair deal. So humanitarian aid would be always in this political situation, uh, a, a kind of negotiation, a discussion, and very often a compromise with the same principle of humanitarian aid, which are giving help to the people in need and to do it in an impartial and neutral, uh, neutral way. So I think this example give, shows the, the limits of uh, what you can do uh, in this kind of situation. Uh, I would like to give a, a, a second example, uh, which I, 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 I was there for, for in both cases, both in Srebrenica and in, uh, in Rwanda during the genocide, which I'm going to explain now. So as you know, in 1994, there was a genocide uh, in Rwanda and the genocide consisted of uh, killing all the Tutsi people. When I mean all, it's really all. It's men, women, children, and even baby uh, in the womb of, uh, of, the, of the mother. So that's the definition of a genocide, if the extermination of a whole, uh, whole people. So one day, our team arrive in the, the hospital in Butare, in the town where they were working. They arrived there like every morning and all the Tutsi patients and all the Tutsi staff had been killed. They were all killed. So they were only the, the Hutu, the Hutu patient and the Hutu staff left. So what can you do in such a situation? What, what kind of uh, relief can you deliver? What can you do? Uh, we concluded that we cannot continue to work in a situation like that, because if we were doing so, we consider that to, so, to some extent, we would become accomplices of, of the murderer and we would be part of the, of the crime because there is no way you can deliver humanitarian aid if the objective of a government of a faction is to kill uh, a portion of its own, uh, of its own uh, population. And uh, uh, the, the, the historical case, which is very well known by uh, academics working on uh, uh, humanitarian aid, it's the experience of the Red Cross uh, during the Second World War and when the Red Cross, the Geneva, Geneva International Red Cross, was confronted with uh, the extermination camp of the, of the, the Nazis. The Nazis. Uh, and uh, at the time, the Red Cross decided that it could uh, deliver some, uh, some help, some relief in concentration uh, camp. And Today, most uh, people, academics or over, consider that it was a mistake. You know, there are some uh, borderline extreme situation like Auschwitz, Auschwitz en français, where you just have to stop intervening. You cannot do anything in a situation like that because the goal is murdering people. So if the goal is murdering people, there is no place for humanitarian aid and humanitarian organization. And then uh, I come to, to North Korea, and I certainly uh, agree with uh, what uh, Mr. Fisler said, that it's very important to maintain uh, open challenge, to maintain dialogue, to have uh, open discussion. But of course, I think his own presentation shows the difficulties of doing that. Uh, I was uh, really amazed to discover through his presentation that everybody left in North Korea in 2020. 
there is nobody anymore. I don't think that, that COVID is the only one who can uh, explain that. We, we have to acknowledge that the North Korean uh, regime is uh, one, uh, maybe the only uh, uh, true uh, totalitarian uh, regime uh, remaining on the, on the planet. And uh, even if I'm also very much in favor of uh, maintaining uh, dialogue, uh, open dialogue, and trying to speak with this regime and this government, we, we have to acknowledge. Uh, and I think uh, Mr. Fisler's presentation was the proof of that, that it is extremely, extremely uh, difficult. So I would say in the case of North Korea, or although uh, again, I'm not an expert of the, of the situation in North Korea, but I think with uh, my own uh, limited experience there and my more broader experience of uh, humanitarian aid, I think when you are confronted in a situation uh, like uh, North Korea, you have to put a few a minimal uh, condition in order to uh, resume or to continue uh, doing uh, humanitarian aid in, in, uh, in these countries. And I think probably uh, the reason why everybody left, it's not only uh, because of COVID, but because most probably this uh, uh, minimal uh, condition were not uh, really met uh, by uh, the Korean uh, regime. And basically those conditions are, are, those minimal conditions are, are two. I think, first of all, you have to be able as a humanitarian organization, as the UN or as the Red Cross or as Médecins Sans Frontières or the Lutheran, uh, Lutheran World Federation, whatever, you cannot just trust the government. You need to have some kind of minimum free assessment of the need. You need to be able to realize by yourself what is the humanitarian situation. And the government has to accept that to collaborate with you and to help you do, doing so. It's not possible to help people if you don't know what is their situation. If people are starving, you cannot just trust the government to say people are starving. You should be able to assess by yourself that, you, that these people are, are starving. So I would say the, the first, uh, the first uh, minimum condition and principle that should be uh, accept it for resuming and continue continuing humanitarian aid is that uh, is a free assessment of uh, of uh, the need and which mean of course you should uh, which the, co the the correlation with this free assessment is that you should have free access to the victim you should be able to see the victim yourself and often this condition is not really met. Remember the, what Dr. Fisler says that nobody can go out of Pyongyang and even there are very few people in Pyongyang. So how can, how can you assess the real situation if you cannot move at all uh, in the country and if you have so, so few foreigners in the country? The second condition is to be able either to deliver the relief, the food, the drugs, whatever it is, uh, yourself, or if you cannot do it yourself, uh, that the government should accept some control uh, by humanitarian organization or on, on the way they deliver the relief and the goods. Uh, you cannot just give the relief to the government and say, okay, I wash my hand and I don't know what's going to happen. Because as in the case in the former Yugoslavia, that might end up in the North Korean army or police or secret service or whatever, you know? So the second condition after the free assessment of needs is to be able either to deliver 
or to control uh, the delivering of the relief uh, supplies. I think these are two minimal conditions. Of course, if, you, if we would live in a perfect world, uh, there would be others. But those two, I think, are, are minimum. Well, having said that, I, I would like to, to say again that as uh, Mr. Fisler, I also uh, strongly be, believe on maintaining open challenge, on dialogue, on having humanitarian and peace initiative. This is, this is very important. I was very moved to uh, find out that the founder of UPF were themselves a uh, refugee from North Korea. So I think it's something going to the heart and it's uh, and we have to take this into account uh, personal of ex personal of experience of people if uh, is extremely uh, ex extremely important and i fully support uh, dialogue and uh, and channel but you know to have dialogue you need to be two you cannot have a dialogue uh, alone so yes the un uh, governments and relief organizations should make an offer, but on the other hand, uh, it's up to the North, uh, North Korean regime and government uh, to decide if they want to accept it and at the end of the day, if they really want to improve uh, the situation of their own people. Thank you. Thank you very much for these explanations. And it's really useful to understand that we need to keep this political context into account. And the two points uh, you, you needed, as many, uh, you, you mentioned, as minimal con conditions, it's really important also to keep them in mind. Sometimes we're just idealistic and we think, oh, there's people suffering, let's just go. And clearly, history shows that sometimes we don't improve the situation. We even make it worse. So thank you very much for these explanations. Now we will turn to uh, Miss, Mrs. Brigitte Wada. She is French. She's married to a Japanese. And she's a mother of five children. And she holds the office of Vice President of Women's Federation for World Peace Europe. And since 2008, also President of Women's Federation for Peace in France. She has worked to organize numerous meetings and conferences in France, among them the European Conference on Dignity in Paris in 2009. She has been developing Women's Peace Academy, involving young women and mothers to share their expertise on health, education, and environment. Brigitte, you have the floor. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Chantal, for uh, this introduction. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. Thank you very much. So I would say it is uh, really a great honor to be part of this session. And then I want to thank as well the organizers for inviting me here. Um, I would like to talk about the contribution of the Women Federation for World Peace to the reconciliation of the Korean Peninsula. But just a few words about the Women Federation in a short. Um, Women Federation for World Peace was founded in 1992 by Mrs. Aksha Moon in Seoul with the support of her late husband, Reverend Samyon Moon. And then through numerous humanitarian activities, particularly in developing countries, um, Women Federation for World Peace International was granted general consultative statute with the UN Economic and Social Council in 1997. So some of our activities focus as well on the reunification of the Korean Peninsula. Or oh, reunification sometimes is a big word, but at least we try. And then I would like to speak about one of the projects. So it's more about the best practices. Um, about the 1% love share project that the Women Federation in Korea developed. So first of all, as I will share um, the PowerPoint, just a moment. Uh, yes, right. 
Okay. Oh, I am already at the end. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, um, so where the idea of the first, as uh, so one person love share project came from. Um, in 2001, 10 years after the River Moon and his wife visit to North Korea. Uh, sorry, Brigitte, can you put the PowerPoint? I mean, can you? Oh, sorry. Yes, of course. I'll see it better. Yeah, can you see great. it? Yes. yes. So Dr. Lanyan Moon, uh, who was president of the International Women's Federation at that time, was one of 10 representatives of the South Korean Women's Leadership Association invited by the North Korean Women's Association to visit Pyongyang. So in fact, uh, she was even born in North Korea and during the Korean War, a family had to flee to the South. When she received the invitation to go to Pyongyang, she felt both excitement and fear at the thought of stepping into North Korean soil after more than half of a century. So this is something to do with her heart. So during the eight days she stayed in Pyongyang, uh, she became really aware and, uh, of the reality of the daily difficulties and the poor living conditions of the North Korean people. So when she returned from Pyongyang, she launched this project uh, from the 1% Love Project. So what is um, this project about is, uh, is a project that was created with the belief uh, that reunification between South and North Korea can be achieved on the basis of reconciliation and positive change in the hearts of South and North Koreans. So that was the start. So the project involves uh, setting aside 1,000 won, which is not so much, one euro, one dollar, uh, each month to help the poorest people, especially women and children. So this amount seems very, very uh, uh, small. So, but it is really at, um, affordable to everyone. Everyone can give something. But of course, many people give more than just one euro every month. They give bigger donation. So this initiative first developed into a national movement and then received the contribution of several women associations around the world and the various women federation for world peace chapters in Europe as well. And the Women Federation for World Peace France as well made action to collect donation, which was a afterwards given to the Women Federation in Korea uh, for their activities, for their project. So as a result of this, uh, of this effort for reunification, Women Federation Korea became a member of the Korean National Council for Reconciliation and Cooperation, which has a membership of about 200 NGOs. So this council has a counterpart in, also in North Korea. So what has been the, the, the supplies? So we, so supplies were sent two or three times a year uh, by land or sea. Uh, whenever possible, we, we will find out what they needed and which organization to send it to, sometimes with the help, of course, of other NGOs. For example, we send the rice and flour, blankets, warm clothes and school supply for the children. In 2005, as well, Women Federation uh, Korea also participated with other NGOs in the reforestation of the Kaesong region and also provided um, emergency aid to victims of the devastating flood in July 2006 and 2007. In uh, 2008, also, it donated building materials and paint to renovate a kindergarten uh, in, in the north. So, but since few years, of course, as you know, due to the tense diplomatic relationship between the two countries, it has been difficult uh, for uh, this project to, to, at least for our leaders, uh, to go to North Korea and to provide assistance there. But another point which is also very important is that they also have been helping 
uh, North Korean refugees to adapt to South Korean society and has offered also several scholarships to help them. So they arranged to organize several sis I mean, sisterhood ceremonies, means um, between refugees, women uh, from North Korea and women from South Korea in order to create heart-to-heart uh, -heart links. So this is also very particular to Women's Federation to create bridges where there is conflict, try to create bridges between women from different um, boards. Um, so building on this foundation uh, of trust, I think this was important, building on this foundation of trust, Dr. Lai Moon, that you can see uh, on this picture, uh, she's in the violet, um, and her team were able to organize a World Assembly of Women Leaders in 2007 at Hong Kong, Kong, North Korea. I was also lucky to, enough to participate. And then with other, of course, uh, uh, members of the Women Federation in Europe. A small French delegation accompanied me among the 740 representatives of 50 nations from all over the world. The North Korean authorities sent an official delegation of 10 senior officials to the symposium. It was the first time that an international gathering of this magnitude has been held in North Korea since the division of the peninsula, and especially to promote world peace and the reunification of North and South Korea. In the lead up to the event, it took several meetings to find common ground between the North and the South. As you share, we need to make some common ground, which is important to make a meeting um, successful. However, we all share a very inspiring and hopeful moment, especially on the last day of the program. At the end, we each lead a candle and sang the unity song with also a woman from North Korea, expressing her hope for peace and reconciliation. So for me, this moment va was very intense moment and an unforgettable memory as well. And it was like, that's it, already unification is coming. <laughs> but it's not the case, of course, today we know. So I just have some reflection about, you know, how can humanitarian aid contribute to the reunification of Korea? So through all this, um, I mean, investment, I can see that through continuous effort uh, and without any political agenda. And also it's a way to, I think it's important to invest with a sincere and humble and altruistic attitude because the experience was that these um, ladies who went to North Korea, they felt that they, they opened the heart of the other woman. And then also it's important to establish a mutual trust in the long term. So through humanitarian, humanitarian initiative, I think it's possible. And then also, this is a way to get to know the other one. Uh, often we have some concept or some prejudice about the other one, but by being on the field or going on the, on the ground, then we come to know each other and build up relationships so we can have another view of the other one. And the heart is changing. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, and then too recently, just to, to, to quickly share about that, um, in the recent webinar in Women Federation Europe, um, was sharing about a proposal which is a, a peace mark, a peace park in the DMZ, a place to create links. Um, it has been mentioned already in some other webinar, but uh, it has something deep into our heart. This could be a meeting place for women in the DMZ. And this park would be a site where regular sharing between women and from North and South Korea could generate innovative strategy for peace and human development. So I don't know if you, this picture may say something to you, but this is in my mind. And maybe I'm too naive, I don't know. But I think that the more we are doing effort and the more we are exchanging, there is in through humanitarian initiative or many or some other ways, uh, the more chance there is for dialogue between both governments. Maybe this is one way. This is question mark as well. 
But I think if he comes also from the bottom, he can also touch a heart of the top. At least this is a, uh, my thought. And this is why I think it's a pity that the UN with a sanction, uh, with a sanction imposed on North Korea is preventing humanitarian organizations from continuing to help the population. Of course, we know there is some big agency that's still working in North Korea, but as we heard just now that many of them cannot even stay. Um, so, but the sanction penalized especially the population and which is already suffering from its isolation rather than the leader themselves. So here they are smiling, but um, I hope internally they, they, they will be really one day be able to smile in a true way. So I want to finish soon with this quote, um, which I found from Dr. Samyan Moon, who is also co-founder of the Women's Federation for World Peace International. The unity of the Korean Peninsula cannot be achieved through political, economic, or military means. None of this will succeed without another prerequisite, which is true love. Effort to improve ties between the two sides in the political, economic, or military fields will only achieve unity if they are motivated by true love. So I put effort on yellow because I think all effort uh, should be made with solidarity or compassion and empathy, and they are essentially gradient for unification or reunification. They are the ingredient. And just uh, the last word, I would like also to emphasize uh, the importance of the role of women uh, as a as a being in a, a women's federation. I mean, I would like to emphasize this this role. Uh, the role of women in conflict resolution and particularly in the reconciliation of the Korean Peninsula. Women in general, through their ability to reach out to others, are concerned with limiting victims and damage. They can initiate change. It is almost in our nature to mitigate hunger and hatred and move towards reconciliation. So, of course, together with, with men, no problem, but it is in the nature of a motherly heart to want to comfort um, his children. So this is with this kind of heart that I want to finish uh, this uh, presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Brigitte, for this uh, presentation. It gave, uh, gave us the opportunity to, to see some projects that were realized in North Korea and on the foundation of having established trust, right? with the people there, but also on, on the foundation of people feeling they want to contribute. And this 1% fund, Love Share, right, that you call Love Share, although very little, but mm -hmm. it's just a thought and it's, it's something substantial. That coming together can become substantial enough to, uh, to give things and especially to create bridges. And the bridges among women, I can see that they can compensate many uh, like uh, divisions created by human beings. <laughs> so, anyway, so thank you. Now um, we will uh, go to the questions from the, from the public. And to moderate the questions from the viewers, I'll give the word to Melanie Kumagata. She holds a bachelor's degree in international relations from the University of Geneva and is currently doing her master's degree on East Asian studies. She's married to a Korean citizen and will write her thesis on the issue of the Korean Peninsula. So Melanie, you have the word. Hello, good afternoon. And thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to ask a few questions to our keynote speakers. And I will start actually with a question to Mr. Fissler. Uh, despite the fact that he's not present with us today, we still have a recorded answer from him uh, for the following question. When do you think North Korea will open, open up its borders and what may happen then? So this is the recorded answer. As mentioned, there are different opinions, but I believe that North Korea will only open its borders once the pandemic is truly over 
across the world. So we can expect that no assistance will move into the country on, for the next one or two years at least. And in the beginning, I believe North Korea will only allow humanitarian goods. Staff, international staff will follow at a later stage. So we'll have to provide some goods um, and we will have to assume that the situation, especially in rural areas, uh, uh, on child nutrition has worsened since 2019. So any humanitarian support is actually a totally new restart from zero. There is no presence, there is no logistics, so we'll have to start from scratch. So what could be the opportunities and the way forward? We will have to accept the prevailing, mostly logistical conditions and should accept for whatever rules or regulations the government will impose. The start will be minimal, I'm very sure of that. Providing medical equipment and hardware even thinking of COVID-19 vaccines uh, is certainly one of the priorities. Though I believe that uh, the nutritional status of the children is more urgent than having the entire nation uh, vaccinated with uh, COVID-19 vaccines. What would be important is for those ex Patriot staff from INGOs and so on, which are able to move into the country at the given time, it will be very important that highly experienced people will move there. People which have been uh, earlier working in the country, which have been recognized by the government and trusted. I think confidence and trust is the key word in building up or continue to have good relations, which allows to do some humanitarian work in the country. So anyone who has an opportunity to send in international staff should keep that in mind. One has to keep in mind as well that at the time humanitarian assistance is needed in North Korea, there will be a worldwide surge in assistance required due to the pandemic worldwide. So we will have good reasons to assume that funding for North Korea isn't going to be on a high priority. So reopening humanitarian operational space will be a cumbersome process. That was a very insightful answer from Mr. Fiesler. And uh, I will directly continue with a question to Dr. Destex. So the first one is, do you see humanitarian aid organizations as a normal phenomenon in society or more as a tool for where the state fails? No, the, this is the, the former. Uh, I, I think one of the great trends of the last uh, 30 or 40 years uh, was the development of um, NGOs and independent uh, relief organization. In the historical term, this is uh, relatively new uh, and uh, it really uh, take off in the, in the 70s and in the 80s. So, of course, uh, some government, uh, uh, which is uh, normal in politics, try, they try to use this movement to, uh, to uh, implement or to speed up their own agenda. But there are today many, many, many uh, independent uh, NGOs and relief organizations in all fields, uh, women, uh, humanitarian aid, agriculture, gender, whatever. There's so many uh, medical, agriculture, climate. Uh, there's so many fields. So I think this is a, a strength uh, for society. And uh, definitely this is a major trend in the last uh, 
30 years the development of independent relief organization. Thank you very much for your answer. Um, I have now a question for uh, Mrs. Wada. Um, due to the difficulties for humanitarian aid to go to North Korea, how do you now continue with the One Person Love Share project? Uh, yes, is this true that uh, since a few years it has been difficult to go or to, to assist in North Korea? So this, uh, this money collected for the One Person Love Share also has been serving to help uh, women and children who have been victims from uh, natural catastrophe. I mean, in other countries, I will say, not only for North Korea, because we could not uh, send that money. So we, we use it for some other um, other project. But still, um, uh, this project still remains because we, we heard from Ms. Mr. Fischler um, that, of course, once Korea will be more open or North and South Korea will be open or the border will be open, I think not only Korea, but all the whole international um, will, will, will come to help, or maybe we will need a lot of uh, financial support uh, from different ways to support uh, or to assist um, in North Korea. So I do believe, I mean, personally in France, we keep, we, we still continue the 1% love share. And uh, for me, it's something that uh, it is deep in my heart because it's not so much one, one euro. It's like we have also this, uh, in France, we have this uh, uh, yellow money. I don't know how to explain that in English, but may maybe Mr. Dexter know about that. You know, we, we gather all the yellow money in one, and then at the end, it, it makes a lot of money. And then this money is, it, is served for, you know, for uh, AIDS or for humanitarian projects. So, Anyway, I, I, I still do believe we will continue. And also another part is also that in North, in uh, Korea, Women Federation Korea is helping also uh, North Korean refugees, because as we know, um, they have some difficulties to integrate in the South Korean uh, society because of the different of thought and different kind of ideology, of course. And so um, they also supporting and uh, uh, them in South Korea, yeah, and to education or different different activities they are doing. Thank you very much for sharing with us all these activities that are still uh, happening. Um, now, another question for Dr. Destex. You've mentioned about two genocides that happened, and um, also you've mentioned that to some extent, if the humanitarian organization uh, kind of have a blind eye upon what is happening politically, then they can become accomplices of this murder and, and be part of the crime. And uh, there are actually some academic articles on the famines uh, that happened in the 1990s in North Korea. And in some articles, they claim that this is actually a, a genocide, this starving. So in that case, would you think uh, in the same way, and in, would it also mean that humanitarian organizations would have to give their aid in a different way to not have this blind eye and to really see the, the political situation as well? Well, this is an extremely interesting but also complex uh, question that uh, would deserve uh, an answer. Uh, 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 another webinar, uh, may, maybe not only on this uh, uh, topic. First of all, on North Korea, let, let me say that I'm not enough an expert. I, I don't follow enough the, the situation uh, to qualify uh, what uh, is going on there. I, I would tend to say uh, that it's not uh, a genocide. Uh, uh, a genocide is a, is a very extreme uh, experience. Is the, the extermination of a, of a whole people based on uh, ethnicity, uh, race, or political uh, ground. So, I, I, and there, there are two definitions of a genocide. A gen there is a legal UN definition from a UN uh, convention from uh, 1948, if I'm right. Which was based on uh, by which was uh, uh, initiated by a, a Polish uh, lawyer, Mr. Lemkin, 
And the, 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 this definition, it's the, the intention to kill a people based on political, religious, or ethnic ground. There is, I think, a, an easier definition in order uh, for, to, for, for, for everybody to understand that the genocide is the extermination of women and, and children in order for the group not to be able to reproduce itself. So for example, in the case of Rwanda, there were also many Hutu people killed by the regime of President Abiyarimana at the time. But the Hutu were killed because they were political opponents. They were killed, but not their wives and not their children. For example, the prime minister Hutu, she was an opponent to the regime. She, she became prime minister during the transition, political transition. She was uh, killed, she was murdered, but the, her children were not killed because they, they, the objective was to kill an opponent. In the case of the Tutsi, they all had to die, all, women and children. And you know, uh, the, there is an experience that some people of MSF lived. They heard about the woman, she was, uh, she was Hutu and she was pregnant. But the, 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 the father of the baby uh, in the womb, he was a Tutsi. So according to the tradition, if the father is a Tutsi and the mother is a Hutu, the baby is a Tutsi. And so she was killed, despite the fact that she was a, a Hutu, because the father was a Tutsi. The baby was not even born, okay? So I think this, this explains clearly what is a genocide. So based on this definition, there are very, very few cases uh, uh, of genocide. In fact, there are only two which are fully recognized by the, by the UN. Uh, first of all is the genocide of the Jews and the Tsigan uh, uh, during the Second World War. And the, the second one is the genocide of the, of the, the Tutsis in, uh, in Rwanda. And you can argue also that uh, even the, if the UN didn't exist at the time, you can argue that uh, the Armenian uh, were also the victim of a genocide in uh, 1915 during the First World War. And of course, you can also argue that what happened in Cambodia is a, is a genocide, uh, but uh, I'm in favor of restricting uh, the definition of a, of a genocide. Uh, I don't think you can qualify what happened in uh, North Korea as a, as a genocide, to be frank. Thank you very much <laughs> for your very developed question. I now have a question from Mr. Nematov, and it is to both of you. Uh, why do you think North Korea refused uh, humanitarian aid, and would it be related to the ideology or more to fear? Please, madam, go ahead. Your mic is muted. <laughs> yes. uh, you mean if um, uh, North Korea refuse humanitarian aid? Yeah, that's just what you, you, you mean that. Um, I wonder if they really refuse, really, deep in their heart, because they, they just that they have some pride uh, to accept humanitarian aids. Maybe we need to, to find a way to approach them, not uh, with the attitude to say, we are coming to help you, and because, uh, you know, just we have to maybe, I think it's a question of our own attitude, how we are going to, to approach um, uh, North Korea with the attitude of helping um, them, not because uh, with a kind of, uh, you know, with, uh, with pride, but because we don't, they don't want to feel that we have pity on them, for sure not. That's what also I understood and uh, the testimony we got. But I do believe, I'm sure they are very, in, they, they appreciated at least what we did with the Women's Federation. They all appreciated our, um, what we did. And I think we, we will have continued, especially maybe from the women's side, maybe they are more open heart to that, I don't know. Uh, but at least because they are thinking of the children, they think of their families, they think, you know, uh, often women are thinking more in this way. So they are more open to, to that. And maybe they are more less pride, I don't know. In any case, um, um, uh, we, I think what is important is to continue to offer 
humanitarian aid, but with the right attitude is the best, with love and not with uh, uh, pride, not with pride or, you know, they have to feel genuine heart, I would say. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Destex, would you like to add something upon that? I think the, the, the question is who you speak to. When I was there for, for eight or nine days, we were not able to speak with any normal uh, Korean people. We did try a lot. It was not possible. Uh, even our translator, they spoke perfect French, really perfect. I, I was very impressed because they never went out of the country, but they, the French were absolutely excellent. But even with our translator, it was impossible to have a conversation uh, outside the official uh, translation. When we tried to speak with them in an informal way, this was not possible. And uh, also a few times we tried to approach uh, some people having some kind of picnic in the parks in Pyongyang. And uh, both the, the people were reluctant to speak to us and the translator were reluctant to translate. So this is, uh, this is my answer. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, Mr. Fisler explained, I fully agree with what he said. We, we have to maintain dialogue and try to offer aid and to try to maintain channel, but that's extremely difficult. And, uh, difficult. and we, we clearly can see that the pandemic is not the only reason to, 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 to close, uh, to close the, the country. I think that's, uh, that's very, uh, that's very uh, obvious that it's not the it's not the only uh, the only reason. And also, uh, I was surprised by the 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 amount he gave. If I'm right, he, he mentioned fifty million dollar at best two or three years ago when humanitarian aid was at its peak. Is am I correct? Did I understand well? Fifty million. Yeah, I heard the same. Yeah. If you know, fifty million in terms of uh, humanitarian aid, uh, global humanitarian aid, is just ridiculous. Uh, when you have a, a major emergency somewhere, we are speaking of hundreds of millions of dollars. So, fifty million dollars is for for uh, uh, it's it's the it's the amount of the budget of a big NGO, but it's not the the amount of the budget for the UN or for the you know, the, the Federation of the Red Cross and so on. So even when things were better, let's say, uh, the humanitarian uh, aid was very, very limited according to what I heard before. Thank you very much for all your answers. We had many more questions, but it's already time <laughs> for the end of this Q&A session. So thank you so much. And I will pass on the word again to our moderator. Thank you to all of you. It was very nice to participate to the this UPF uh, the, uh, conference. I'm grateful, and I hope we can continue this uh, interesting dialogue. Yeah. And I hope uh, uh, Madame uh, Vada will succeed with uh, this project. I think it's a very good idea to have this mm -hmm. kind of uh, place for dialogue, even if it's difficult to implement uh, right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Before before closing. I would like to ask uh, uh, Dr. De Destex if you have one recommendation <clears throat> or uh, one, one, one thing that we can take away, the most important thing to take away from this uh, uh, conversation, what would it be? Well, I, I, I can only repeat my, my conclusion. I, I, I think uh, you cannot just uh, deliver uh, aid or relief without any kind of condition. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a compromise. It's going to be a compromise between the regime who most probably will want to control absolutely everything and, and the fact that you have to have, as I said, minimal condition, which are uh, independent assessment of the needs. For example, if uh, there is a famine or starvation of children, as uh, Mr. Fisler mentioned. Mm. You you need to be able to assess that by uh, by uh, by yourself. Uh, uh, and if uh, you want to give uh, a lot of aid, you you need to be able, at minimum, 
to have some kind of control to what you give. So that would be my uh, my recommendation and my lessons. But these are not uh, a way to say that you should not help uh, the North Korean uh, population on the country. Yeah. Thank you. It's really a question between the own conscience, feeling the suffering of the people, and then looking at what's happening, right? And yes. uh, if you have no way of controlling or anything, that must be so painful for the people involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Mrs. Wada, do you have a final <laughs> recommendation or takeaway that you'd like to mention? Uh, of course, we spoke a lot about uh, confidence and trust mm. uh, to keep the dialogue, uh, which is very important. We spoke about constant effort. It doesn't come so quickly. I think we need to have time uh, to allow time uh, for, uh, for the dialogue to come. Uh, this is maybe one of the recommendations, not to give up, maybe, <laughs> not to abandon uh, even if it seems to be very difficult in this time. Mm. So maybe, maybe this point, from this point of view, yeah. Thank you. So in this way, you're saying the same thing as uh, Mr. Fisler, yeah. right? That we really, the organizations, all of us need to keep the channels open That's right. and uh, really be ready to start again when it's possible, exactly. as long as we keep also the funds available for that time. So thank you very much for the constructive interactions we had. I hope you all enjoyed the discussion. There were many questions still open, like uh, we said before. And uh, uh, maybe some of them will be answered in the webinars that are coming up. Uh, we have uh, for two more days uh, on August, uh, for two more days tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. But also we'll have another series of webinars from August 19th to 21st. And everything you can see on our UPF uh, website, eume.upf.org. There you can find all the uh, reports on our webinars. And uh, I, I think this webinar was also one more way to support the Think Tank 2022 and the envisioned goal of a unified Korean family, which is like a step forward towards world peace. And just to mention something positive, in June 2020, the two Koreas severed all into Korean hotlines. 10 months later, the two leaders started active communication through letters. And just this morning at 10 a.m., North and South Korea reestablished their communication channels. So I'm very happy that we can end this on a positive note because that is what's needed to restore trust and confidence to continue to uh, uh, have communication. And now to celebrate that uh, good news, we will end this webinar with a North Korean song. It's the re reunification rainbow song. And I want to thank especially our speakers for their great contribution. Also wholeheartedly, I thank all the viewers from around the world for listening, interacting, asking and answering questions and for your precious attention. And finally, even also the UPF staff who prepared and made this webinar possible. So goodbye with the uh, unif reunification rainbow song. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>